So a little bit of context before we hear the scripture readings. The first reading is from Amos. I love the book of Amos. Martin Luther King loved the book of Amos. Amos lived in the 8th century BCE, a terrible time in Israel's history. The few rich were not just rich, obscenely rich. They drank wine out of bowls. They drank, they, they slept in beds carved out of ivory, obscenely rich. And the many poor, the mostly poor, were obscenely poor. Amos saw immorality. He saw corruption in the courts. He saw that the social framework of the nation of Israel, the northern nation of Israel, had been so badly bent and the threads so badly frayed, it looked as though they wouldn't be able to stand against their rival Assyria. So Amos, like all good Hebrew prophets, listened to God, channeled God's voice to the people, and God's message essentially was, you are treating one another so badly, I don't even want your worship anymore. I don't want your fancy songs anymore. What do I want? Just this. Let justice flow down like waters and righteousness like mighty streams. Following that, we will hear the Gospel of John's version of a portion of the John the Baptist story, along with Jesus' calling of the first disciples. Interesting that the other Gospels show Jesus spending some time on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, spending time with building relationships with struggling fishermen in the collapsing fishing industry. And from there, Jesus drew his pool of disciples largely. But in John's gospel, the disciples seem to just kind of pop out of thin air. But again, John's is the more poetic of the four gospels. Following the readings, we'll hear the choir sing a meditation on Martin Luther King Jr. composed by the Irish band U2. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord. In all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning, and those skilled in lamentation to wailing. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them. And the offerings of your well-being of your fatted animals. I will not look upon Take away from me the noise of the songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And in the New Testament we read, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. 
And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with waters said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon, and one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Let's pray. Beloved God, in celebrating the birthday of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., may we about, may we be about continuing the building of his dream. We ask this in your many, many holy names. Amen. I love this time of year. I love it that once each year, I have a built-in reason to read more widely, to think more deeply about one of the great lives of our time, that of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And as the years have gone by, I have seen that our observation of his birthday have become more and more and more reduced to a long weekend off. And the momentous question of our day is not so much what does his life mean to ours, but do we get three days or four days off this week? Worse than that, in my book, our culture loves to put heroes up on pedestals, safely out of practical reach. And anything he did was because of who he was. Nothing that any of us could possibly aspire to. He was king. He was different. He was a different, a different category of human being than us. Put him on a pedestal. And more than that, even, we freeze his life in one moment of time, over-rehearsing, over-repeating that one speech of his many great speeches and sermons, his I Have a Dream speech, Count how many times you hear over this weekend, I have a dream today, before the holiday weekend is over. The poet Carl Wendell Hines Jr. wrote, Now that he is safely dead, let us praise him, build his glory, sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes. They cannot rise to challenge the images we would fashion from their lives. And besides, it is easier to build monuments than to build a better world. It is easier to build monuments than to build a better world. So, here in church, in churches through the land, let's use this holiday instead to continue to build a better world by reflecting on his words and on the words underlying his. Often, when I'm doing the children's sermon on this weekend, I ask the children to tell me about him, and few of them know that he was a minister. I think that's been lost in much of our culture as well. He was not just a minister, but he earned a doctorate in theology from Boston University. He combined a fierce intellect with powerful preaching. Years, years ago, in a previous church, I would take one of his sermons every year and I would rewrite it and present it to the church. They'd go, oh, that was so wonderful. And I'd say, actually, it was Martin Luther King. 
And they go, oh, oh. But, man, I had to work on those sermons. They were long. They were information dense. I mean, they were fabulous, meaty. And did I say long sermons? <laughs> he was a fine, fine, fine intellect and preacher. And he was always grounded in the scriptures, particularly the Hebrew prophets as they channeled God's passion for justice. Amos was a favorite. And you could do worse this afternoon than to go home and sit down and read the book of Amos. The first two chapters, you're going to be bored. You're going to say, what's going on here? What's going on? It, it looks like it's just a condemnation of the other nations, as if I was to stand up here and say, oh, oh, um, Russia, boy, they're really going to get theirs. Oh, oh, Libya, they're really going to get theirs, and go down the list of nations. And finally, after that long litany, you come to, and by the by, our nation also not doing so well. That's what happens in Amos. And then you get to that famous point where God is saying, I actually hate and despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me the best of your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them anymore. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like mighty waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. What King knew was that our faith is not only a vertical faith, a personal faith in God and a personal walk with God, which is where so many people want to reduce their faith. Oh, my faith, it's just between God and me. It's just a personal thing. It's just me and my buddy God. King knew that, and, and he knew this to his bones, that our life of faith moves us to a horizontal dimension. He had a whole sermon on the horizontal dimension of faith. Our faith moves us to love one another and to love our enemies, and he was very prescriptive how. Another whole sermon on how to love our enemies. And he knew that our horizontal faith calls us to love one another and love our enemies, not only in acts of charity, but in working for justice. Just two months before his death, he delivered his famous drum major speech. And he had a premonition that he wasn't going to live long. And in talking about after his death, he said, tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. If you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. If we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King, let's build monuments of justice, flowing down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And let's build monuments of interconnection. Let's build movements. You know, we, we tend to think that he was this genius prophet who sprung out of nowhere fully formed. He was well mentored by his father, by Howard Thurman, who we spoke of last week, by, Ryan, by the works of Reinhold Niebuhr, by Bayard Rustin, among many others. He was inspired by and visited with Gandhi. At the beginning of his ministry of activism, especially during the Montgomery bus boycott, he was well-tutored. Do you know he was 27 years old? 27. Can you imagine? And a man named Bayard Rustin would secretly come to town to school him in nonviolent resistance theory and techniques. His is a fascinating story, and there's a Netflix movie coming out sometime this year on Bayard Rustin. We all need to watch it. Anyway, he did not spring into this world fully formed. 
Jesus, for that matter, did not spring out of nowhere a Messiah fully formed. At least I don't think he did. I believe he was mentored at least by John the Baptist, possibly by the Essenes, a Jewish sect that was a renewal and purity movement, as well, of course, as by his mother, a woman with a passion for justice as shown in her song, The Magnificat. Nor did Jesus try to accomplish his ministry alone. He gathered and he trained disciples. I think it was the scholar John Crossan who pointed out that one big difference between John the Baptist and Jesus was that John was an individual entrepreneur while Jesus called and trained disciples. John was an entrepreneur. Jesus built franchises. And his franchises long outlasted him. I recently ran across this old Maya Angelou poem. Lying, thinking last night, how to find my soul a home where water is not thirsty and bread loaf is not a stone. I came up with one thing, and I don't believe I'm wrong, that nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. If we are to honor the ministry of Martin Luther King, let's not just build monuments of stone, but monuments of movements. Movements for racial justice, movements for economic fairness, movements for peace. We cannot do that kind of work alone. We've tried to here for a good long time, and some of the most exciting work that our racial justice committee has ever done is happening right now behind the scenes as we're reaching out to the Christian and interfaith community to build a movement here in Beaverton to work together. We met yesterday morning in an organizing meeting out in the Narthex. So circle January 29th at 3 p.m. on your calendar for a community meeting at Bilal Mosque that we are taking the lead in organizing. We cannot do the work alone. Third, if we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King in our time, let's build monuments of justice, monuments of connectedness and movements, and let's build monuments of larger dreams. King's dreams were so much bigger than we tend to remember. Remember that following the passage of the Civil Rights Act, King turned his face toward the problem of poverty. How much of us remember that today? How much of that is mentioned in the media? In that drum major speech, he recounted that while he was in jail in Montgomery, he talked with his white jailers there. After a day or two, he came to ask them about where they lived, how much they earned, and he told them, you know, you ought to be marching with us. You're just as poor as Negroes, he said. All you are living on is the satisfaction of your skin being white and the drum major instinct of thinking that you're somebody because you are white, and you're so poor you can't even send your children to school. True compassion, King said, is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. He was talking about restructuring the systems that create poverty in our country and in our world. And then once he became involved in the war on poverty, it didn't take him long to see that the war in Vietnam was draining the funds from the war on poverty. And beyond that, it was becoming very difficult to train young people in nonviolent resistance when the nation was training young people to export violence overseas. Just four days before his assassination, he spoke at the National Cathedral and he pointed out the war in Vietnam has played havoc with our domestic destinies. This day we are spending $500,000, that was in 1968 money, to kill every Viet Cong soldier. $500,000. Every time we kill one, we spend about $500,000, while we spend only $53 a year for every person characterized as poverty-stricken in the so-called anti-poverty program which is not even a good skirmish against poverty. So I did a little math myself. Have you ever looked up the dollar costs of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001? 
a group at Brown University is now saying it's just a little bit over eight trillion, with a T, dollars. Eight trillion dollars. And by my very rough math, I mean, it's hard to understand what eight trillion dollars is, but I think that money could have provided 1.6 million dollar 1.6 million low-income people with health care for 10 years. 1.2 million Head Start places for children for 10 years. 106,000 elementary school teachers for 10 years. Or 12,000 plus police or sheriff's patrol call officers for 10 years. 907,000 full scholarships for university students for 10 years or 800,000 apartments for homeless Oregonians for 10 years. Eight trillion dollars. If we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King in our time, let's build monuments out of larger dreams. Let's build that beloved community about which he loved to talk. For King, the beloved community was not an unreachable utopian ideal to be confused with the rapturous image of the peaceful kingdom where we see lions lying down with lambs. The beloved community was a, is a realistic goal that can be achieved by a critical mass of people committed to and trained by the philosophy and methods of nonviolence. King's beloved community, inspired by the Bible and grounded in the Constitution and Bill of Rights, began as a dream for our entire country that we would live out our principles of freedom and democracy broadly and faithfully for every American. And his dreams soon went global. He spoke with an almost mystic familiarity about a world where all people can share in the wealth of the earth. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of decency just won't allow it. Racism, and all forms of discrimination and bigotry and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. In his dream, international disputes will be resolved by peaceful conflict resolution and reconciliation of adversaries instead of the default being military power. Love and trust will triumph over fear and hatred. Peace with justice will prevail over war and military conflict. He pointed out again and again that we are all tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly, affects others, affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am all that I ought to be. If we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King in our time, let's build our monuments out of larger dreams. And finally, if we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King, let's build them on his chosen foundation, the presence and the power of God. He was a lot like us here at Cedar Hills, when you think about it. He loved to read. He loved to write and think and debate and discuss. For a long time, he kept God at a respectable arm's length. Did you know that? But at the beginning of the bus boycott, emerging as leader of the movement at the tender age of 27 in his first call, for crying out loud, he was a reluctant prophet, and he began to lag in spirit as the boycott went on and on, and the death threats against him and his family increased. He would get calls in the middle of the night, call off the boycott or die. Jail was a very real threat. He imagined himself being lynched. One Friday night, late in January of 1956, King couldn't sleep. The phone rang, another death threat. He walked to the kitchen, made some coffee, slumped in his chair, and later he wrote about that night. He said, I was ready to give up. With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, 
I began to think of a way to move out of the picture without looking like a coward. In the state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I'm here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. He continues, at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could stand up, I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, he says, my fears began to go, my uncertainty disappeared, and I was ready to face anything. If we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King, let's build monuments of justice flowing like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. If we're to honor his ministry, let's not just build monuments of stone, but monuments of movements. Movements for racial justice, for economic fairness, for peace. If we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King in our time, let's build monuments of larger dreams. And finally, if we're going to build monuments to Martin Luther King, let's build them relying on the presence and the power of God. These are the monuments that will do credit to his ministry. These are the monuments that will bless our lives and collectively the life of the world. Amen. <laughs>